This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Another awesome week talking smallmouth bass. We covered a wide variety of of anglers uh, through this podcast series so i appreciate everybody listening we're learning a lot along the way super exciting stuff our guest tonight knows how to catch them we're talking inland lakes tonight so smaller bodies of water well smaller compared to maybe the great lakes and some of these other large fisheries across the country but i'm super excited to find out what andrew has to say about fishing some inland lakes. But before we get into that, I want to talk about the real shot. Of course, the real shot has all the most wanted bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could ask for. Top brands like Mega Bass, Jackal, Evergreen Z-Man, Daiwa Shimano, Berkeley, Rapala, list goes on and on. Kai Tech, they just have a bunch of awesome tackle. And their website, therealshot.com, is where you can go to make sure you have... All the gear, all the tackle that you need for your next big bass adventure or your next tournament. And if you head on over, you guys know you can use my code SMALLMOUTHCRUSH15. And they're going to be giving you 15% off your first order. So head on over to therealshot.com. Let them know that Smallmouth Crush sent you. All right, and here he is. Andrew Ragus, I got to get that right. Did I did I get it right? You nailed it, buddy. You nailed it. I love it. I love it. So, dude, you know how to catch them in my old my home state where I grew up, upstate. We call it upstate. I'm I'm so used to saying upstate New York. Northern Wisconsin is the correct term. And some huge smallmouth bass come from those lakes. A lot Very of super lakes. A lot of a lot of well-known lakes, but there's a there's so many lakes. How many lakes are up there? You ever count them? Um, well, in Oneida County, where I'm at in Minocqua, we've got about 2,300 fishable lakes, and a couple hundred of them are real good bass fisheries. And then Vilas County, which is just north, um, that one's got about 4,000 different lakes and water bodies with a couple hundred more uh, bass, good bass waters. So we got a lot, just a lifetime of water. It's water world. That's all I was going to say. It's It would take somebody a lifetime to, uh, I mean, you can't. You no, I, I haven't. I, I've just scratched the surface. I'm never going to, you know, achieve fishing all these places in a lifetime. Sure. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted you to have to come on the podcast is because you're a, a true hammer in the northern part of the country. You catch some big, big bass. Uh, you, you run a guide. Tra- I, I want if you could just introduce yourself real quick to everybody and uh, kind of let us know how you got into fishing. Then we'll get into uh, the smallmouth talk. So I'm Andrew. Nice to meet you all. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been a lifetime angler. Um, Our home base is in Minocqua, Wisconsin. Families had property up there since the 1960s. I've been a fisherman my whole life since the age of two when my dad and grandpa would take me out in the boat all day. I'd be playing with the minnows, giving them their bait, hooking up their bait for them. So I have just a lifetime of fishing. Um, And uh, I actually grew up as a walleye and muskie angler at an early age. And over the last 20 years, our bass fisheries in northern Wisconsin and especially all over the state, they've been expanding and growing in terms of bass fisheries. Uh, New fisheries are slowly establishing and lakes that were former powerhouses for muskies and walleyes, they've actually become really good fisheries for bass. So once I started to make that realization about 20 years ago, that's when I got addicted and bitten by the bass bug. And then Uh, When I was in college uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, you know, every single weekend I would leave the city of Chicago with a buddy or two. We'd travel up north. I was a weekend warrior like a lot of folks. I would explore a new fishery or a set of new lakes every single weekend uh, during college and then even after post-graduation when I got out. And, you know, over over the course of learning all these new lakes, that's when I started gaining a following. And then 
five years ago, I had this bright idea. Let's start up a guide service and <clears throat> and let's do something that no one else in my region or anywhere else, you know, on the inland fisheries has ever attempted doing or starting. You know, a lot of folks are into walleyes and muskies still. That's the bread and br bread and butter for Wisconsin. Smallmouth bass, no other fishery, fishing segment in the country has grown exponentially in the last five years like smallmouth bass chasing has outside of muskies. So, you know, five-year plan worked out. It's one of my careers, and I'm really overjoyed and happy of, you know, where it's gone and taken me to. Right, right. All that time on the water, you know, that's uh, that's pretty cool to be able to go out right. there and experience that. You know, there's so many things I want to talk to you about fishing up in that region but you know for our viewers and listeners that may not be from wisconsin or or in that area a lot of these tips i'm sure we're going to go over in techniques are things you can take to your home body of water all over the country wherever it is uh you know i i know you run into a lot of clear water but i'm sure there's some situations where you get a little tannic and stained lakes as well so a variety right. of lakes that you probably fish uh, and so i really want to just let's just start in with with kind of the seasonal pattern and some of the techniques and, and tricks that you've, you, you've used over the years to catch those fish and, and locate them as well. Definitely. You know, do you get a pretty good, uh, do you get an opportunity to fish any, uh, you know, in that pre-spawn stage? I know sometimes the, uh, the seasons are a little different, you know, as far as when bass season actually opens and, uh, you know, I assume some lakes, the spawns a little bit later than others and some lakes, uh, you know, everything happens, but walk me through that. Yeah. So I actually live and die by, by spring. Um, it's just my, my absolute favorite time of year. That's when life starts picking up again, you know, the, the whole aquatic or the whole underwater aquatic ecosystem, it just wakes up. But my challenge every year for the last five years or so has been the timing of ice melt, because, you know, up in Vilas County, Manaqua area, um, it's much colder up there inland. We get a lot of climate that shoots off over uh, Lake Superior that hits us. So we do get like a delayed spring season. Um, where I reside down here, I'm actually in Chicago right now while we're filming this. So our, the season down here in Chicago is about two or three weeks ahead of what northern Wisconsin experiences in spring. So, for instance, uh, ice out happens first week of May. Um, along with that, water temperatures are going to be in the mid, mid 40s to mid 50s for a good two to three weeks. Uh, spring peak generally happens by the third week of May, and that's when things get really good. Um, there's big movements of fish finally moving up into the shallows, or they'll go up into their staging locations. So our patterning, uh, it, we prioritize location over everything else, because if you're not on the good spots and on the money spots on whatever lake you're fishing, you have no chance of catching fish. And I've observed, witnessed, and I've personally dealt with it in the past and through all these growing pains. You know, you can get preoccupied banking or beating the bank a lot, and about 90% of that shoreline is going to be just totally devoid of fish. So you do have to prioritize uh, during the pre-spawn phase of being on these money spots, whether it's a staging site or like a well-known spawning flat on a particular lake that you're fishing. Um, and then spring peak, uh, third week of May, that's around when uh, we get the full moon period. And full moon time is when those big females, they'll typically slide up into the shallows and then they'll start mating or they'll be seeking their mates then at that point. And then once we roll into Memorial Day weekend, around then on a typical spring, that's when a lot of fish start spawning. And then our spring patterns pretty much dissolve overnight, and we're we're already going into sight fishing or bed fishing if that's your game. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the spring fling what we do. And as far as catching fish, I'm huge proponent of jerkbait fishing. It's definitely an art. Um, there's probably no other lure category that you can manipulate the action. You know, you control that lure with your rod, reel, and line choice, and you know, your motion and the cadence of how you want to work that bait. So, right. you know, there's no other lure out there where you can totally control and lure a fish and make a fish react to, to that, you know, action that you're trying to impart on a bait. 
Um, and then another good good tactic that we like fishing uh, that time of year is swimming plastic. So what I mean by that, search lures, paddle tails, swim baits. Um, I'm a huge proponent of Kalen's uh, five-inch lunker grubs, probably one of the most old school, old fashioned, mm -hmm. top number one producing fish catchers of all time. And uh, that lure is definitely not outdated, <laughs> not even now. Uh, but then going back to jerk baits, huge fan of Rapalox wraps. Um, if there's if there's one suspending jerk bait slash slash bait that you need, it's probably a hothead in size eight or size ten. Wow. So, you know, going back to that that pre spawn stage when those fish are not quite moved up yet. And so we're talking more offshore structure. Is that yep. what you're looking for? Are yep. you targeting them with that jerk bait? And what are the water temps normally, right? Right. There? Okay. So normally at that point of year, you're going to be about a week, a week following ice out. The water temps are going to be in that cold upper 40 uh, to low 50 range, maybe. But it all depends on the timing of ice out. You know, some years the ice is free off lakes by mid-April. And what's unique to Wisconsin now is the year-round catch and release season. So guys, you know, wherever they're at in the state, they can, you know, start fishing immediately after ice out. But in my region, there's really no incentive to fishing that early quite yet just because a lot of these fish are still going to be wintering. So it kind of just defeats the whole purpose of, you know, spring patterning. But... Um, you know, technique wise, we're primarily fishing areas that are kind of outside of known wintering sites. Now, what the smallmouth do in the spring after ice melt, they're going to follow a structural migration along the b underwater topography of the lake. Um, you know, they're a highly migratory fish species, much unlike largemouth. So, you know, the smallmouth, they're very relatable to walleyes you know walleyes they undertake spawning migrations you got to think of in the same way of smallmouth they're following those underwater contours they could they could be following a ledge you know the drop off along a point from their wintering site you know in 30 plus feet and then they'll stage in like a, a 10 to 15 foot area zone and those are the staging sites that we like to target you know early on in spring and to get to these fish we like to throw a lot of deep diving cranks that can get down to that depth uh, but um, you know what a benefit with these deep diving cranks is if they can hang and if you can pause them that's when fish can hit them um, blade baits can work very well and also slow rolling uh, swimming plastic like a five inch kalins uh, swimming uh, lunker grub that works mm -hmm. really well too on a heavier jig head and then you know you can also jig with uh, flukes fluke style minnows um, like a kalen's kalen's four or five inch jerk minnow that works just as well too on a heavier jig mm. as far as your cadence on a uh, jerk bait when you, when we're going through the uh the seasonal you know the migration they're moving up to the flats uh is there a difference between you know, have you found between like 45 degree water and 55 degree water? Is it? Yeah, is there's, there's a major, di yeah, major, major difference. It's a world of difference. So, okay. yeah. So like 45 degree water, you got to make a very long pause in between your rips with that bait. And you have to make much tighter, more subtler jerks with that uh, jerk bait. So for instance, when the water's that cold, I probably wouldn't throw the slash the slash bait, the, the X wrap, it just, you know, dives around, darts too much. I'd throw a, a suspending jerk bait that can, you know, it's more compact of a wobble. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, like a Lucky Craft pointer style, you know, like a pointer 100, something of that nature, or a husky jerk, but the husky, you know, like a down deep husky jerk if you can get down to that range. Um, so yeah, like, you know, colder the water, the tighter, the, the tighter, the shorter, the, the jerks longer pauses in between um i know guys personally who have to wait you know they, they've caught fish you know waiting 30 seconds to up to a minute in between jerks and rips and one of the guys uh, I, i'm a huge follower and I, i'd call myself a disciple of his but mike mladenick the menominee river guide up in our region he he fishes that way in early spring and he will wait up to a minute with you know an X wrap or a husky jerk in between rips and he catches fish very successfully. So I've learned that through him. And then, you know, as the water warms up, you'll want to start working your baits with a lot more action and uh, aggression too. So at that point, that's when the X wrap really shines. One of the top producers okay. all time for me and my boat. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, 30 seconds to a minute is, uh, it's extreme. It's, it's, it is. Patience. It's painful. Uh, yeah. if, if you haven't, you know, you think about it, just sitting here or wherever you're at right now, 30 seconds is, is goes by quick, but when you're in a boat <laughs> with a rod in your hand and you're like, what is going on here? But, right. uh, yeah, I've seen it firsthand. It, it does come into play, especially in those, in those, you know, colder temperatures. So yeah. we, you know, we have that spawn, you know, the, in Northern Wisconsin and these inland lakes, how long is that typically last? Um, it'll depend on the climate, you know, some years spawn, you know, they'll be done with it in a week. We've had years and springs where we'll have, you know, 80 degree weather mm -hmm. for over a full week. And this, this can be like mid to late May fish will start nesting. And then by the end of that week, they're off their nests. You know, it can be very quick if it's warm and there's a lot of sun every day. Um, otherwise it, the, the whole period can be very slow too. So typically right around Memorial Day weekend through the first two weeks of June, that's when a lot of the fish, majority of them, they'll be nesting and bedding. And, you know, the colder the climate is, the more prolonged of a spawning period it'll be. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an exciting time to fish, you know, uh, when, when they are up shallow, uh, when they are on the beds, but you know, a lot of times we, we do have to practice. I know you're a pretty big advocate yeah. of just taking care of the fishery, <laughs> right? Uh, right. So we don't, uh, you know, I, for me, I enjoy it. You know, a lot of times I fish tournaments and it's around that time and yeah, we, you have have to, to. we have to target them. Other than that, if there wasn't a tournament for me, I enjoy going out maybe for the first time, you know, one, one time a year and doing it. Um, but I'm sure you're much like, you know, you prefer to maybe not harass them as much. Yeah, you know, no. I remember in the past I would that would I would just it was so easy. And we could talk technique about it, but I don't know if you're in agreement of this, but it's pretty <laughs> simple to catch them off of a bed. Yeah, it's very simple. Yeah. Um a lot of guys that I've hosted or you know, they've read they've read some of my writings in the past. I call that terminology bozo buckets. You know, like the old game show with the clown, Bozo the Clown. You know, so you're flip, you're flipping your bait on top, of, top of like a circular bucket, basically. Sure. As the fish created. So, you know, back back in my my formative years and in my youth, yeah, it was it was fun way of fishing, pretty kick ass way. But then obviously once once science, you know, catches up to modern times. All right, you might have to reconsider all your actions here because it could not, it might not be good for the specific fishery that you're on. Mm -hmm. So, with that being said, you know, there's times and situations where, you know, if I have a guide trip on that day and I'm stuck fishing a lake, and if we're seeing fish up on the beds and we got no other choice, yeah, you kind of have to try targeting them if that's the only option. But, you know, just like you, you know, a lot of other people, you you really want to just fish use tactics that can catch the fish rather than something that's you know exciting but too simple mm, right right yeah that's true i mean a, a lot of that body of water it, if you guys are not familiar with wisconsin i mean you can see in those lakes up north uh, if it's sunny and calm you can see that bed 50 yards away yeah you know? oh yeah it's it's a very uh yeah it's it's it's, it's actually i you know that time of year when i'm on the water and if i'm seeing bedding fish i actually just like parking the boat hovering over them dropping a gopro down and just you know studying them and looking mm -hmm. at them because it is kind of cool to observe oh absolutely yeah yeah for sure so let's talk a little bit you know as, as we move into the summer months uh you, you know june comes around you said you know we do have some times where it could really heat up and and perhaps those fish once they're done, do you see a lot of fish still up shallow in that zone, or do they yes. still go out? A mixture? Yeah, yeah so like mid-June, that's around the time when they when they wrap up their spawn. And then every year around June 15th, that's when I resume guiding for smallmouth. I'll go pretty hardcore up until July 4th. That's usually, you know, my cutoff time. I don't want to be on the water anywhere during holiday week. But, um, you know, that, that third and fourth week of June, there's a, just a huge... I guess I, I wouldn't call it a push of fish up into the shallows, but they're going to stick around for the rest of June as long as the forage species are moving up shallow also. So, you know, on some lakes, smallies, they target crayfish, you know, the natural uh, species of crayfish, the native ones, or the rusty crayfish if that lake has them. You know, cr the, the, the crayfish, they are going to be up moving up shallow at that time of year. Another thing that happens are perch migrations, you know, young hatchlings, they're going to be all over the shoreline areas too, so smallmouth will gravitate towards them. And then another 
another cool thing that happens are mayfly hatches. And usually around the hatch period, you can catch a lot of fish up shallow on hair jigs and then also out in open, open water basins, uh, you know, subsurface or near surface. If you can identify and, you know, visualize and see, you know, surface commotion and activity, those fish are very catchable out in, out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a lot of fish are still generally, they're going to be up shallow, five feet to 10 feet on average. Yeah. It interests me because there's, there's, uh, at, at least in my experience, um, I fish upstate New York quite a bit, not only the big water, but inland lakes as well. <clears throat> and one lake might have a really good top water bite where I can throw like a pop bar or something where the next lake, which is very similar. There's just, they're not looking up for some reason. Do you, do you guys have a good top water bite <laughs> and is it on every lake or is it lake specific? You know, it's more lake specific, but also it'll depend on that year's weather. So like last year, 2020, for instance, my boat couldn't like me or my guests, we couldn't catch a single top water fish all year. And normally that post spawn June till like early July, you know, that's really the time of year when the top water bite is awesome. It can be kick ass. And then also it's one of the best times of the year for the mayfly hatch because around that period, third week of June, you know, once the water temps crest over 70, um, those mayflies will hatch overnight and then even during daytime hours too if it's calm. And, you know, it's, it's, you got like a solid two week window with the hair jig also, but you know, it, it depends on the climate. Um, you know, our weather this last year was horrible, cold front every other day, a lot of rain, a lot of wind. So, you know, when you're dealing with that, those are just non optimal conditions for any top water or hair jig bite. Uh, but like you said, it's, it's very lake specific too. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, a few uh, quite a few podcast episodes back, we had uh, Seth Fighter, who's actually from Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, fishes on on tour, and he was talking about throwing a hair jig around that mayfly hatch, and it was really intriguing. I, I've experienced it a handful of times, but not as often as I'd like. Um, you know, things just didn't line up for me uh, a lot of times when I'm on the body of water where it's happening, but uh, walk me through that, that pattern with, with the hair jig. <laughs> Yeah, so with the hair jig, um, you know, I, I, I'm not particular on any brand. Honestly, some of the best fly tires will create the best marabou jigs just because they've got all the materials. They understand weights on, you know, how to mold a hook, how to attach mm -hmm. the marabou and any other type of feathering. Um, so, you know, if anyone needs recommendations, just befriend a fly tire. Those, those guys are some of the most, you know, hand, handcrafted. You know, they make the best handcrafted lures out there. Uh, but, you know, the mayfly hatch, so what happens, you know, it's like an annual cycle every year. Um, you got the larvae. Uh, they're going to be burrowing over mud flats. And then, you know, they live for one day. So when they hatch, they do their, they do their thing. They'll reproduce, and then they die immediately. So they live mm -hmm. the life, basically. And then they'll sleep right. for a full year until the next year rolls around. So, you know... A lot of lakes up in our region, uh, they do experience mayfly hatches. I've noticed that the, the bigger mayfly hatches will actually occur on clearer bodies of water versus dark darker bodies of water, such as flowages or, you know, like a eutrophic lake. It just doesn't happen as often on those types of waters. But um, clear clear water, big water, very common. Um, and then the hair, the hair jig, you know, it, it works universally all over a lake as long as the fish are present. Um, but the cal the calmer, uh, the weather and the calmer the day, the better the hair jig bite will be on that particular day too. And, um, you know, if, if you're motoring around a basin, mud flats, that's typically where, uh, most of the larvae will rise up and hatch. Um, you can see it on your screen. I run Lorance screens and, you know, most days that time of year, I'm paying attention to the screen. If I'm seeing a bunch of debris, you know, around, you know, mid depth on the screen, uh, on the verge of rising upward across, above the surface, I'm going to make note of that. And then once the hatch is on, I might return to that area. But um, and on, that, on those calm days, you're going to want to observe the surface because at that point, once those little uh, the mayflies are hatching, um, you can see a lot of smallmouth uh, fanning or finning, you know, giving you the fin across the surface. And on some bodies of water, I have found schools of smallmouth, you know, up to 50 to 100 fish, just a wolf pack of them, you know, 
eating and gorging themselves on these mayflies. And on the, wa on the lake that you're on, if you can locate that visually with your eyes, you're in luck. You've hit the gold mine. Right. So it's almost like, you know, these, these, there might be a, a hump out there and, and a transition to mud. And let's just, I'm just giving out examples, maybe a, a quarter of a mile away, there's a mud flat, but that hump was holding a lot of fish. When they know that hatch is going on, do you think those fish will just vacate that, that, that structure and they're just out there over that mud flat just oh being, yeah 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 i've experienced similar stuff like you know whether fish are on money spots one day they, they'll vacate the next day if the hatch is on mm. um i know for instance walleyes and panfish you know they do they, they that's the way they behave too and, it, and once the mayfly hatch happens it actually wrecks the whole food chain you just gotta adjust quickly on the fly then and you know you're gonna you're gonna want to follow where the you know the the food sources are located at on the lake and you're going to want to adjust your your own positioning and fishing tactics too along with that let me ask your opinion on this because a lot a lot of times i hear this excuse from from anglers and it may be correct it, it might not be like i said i don't have as much experience chasing mayflies but when that does happen as small of a bug that these are uh, a lot of people say that they just get they're full and they don't want to eat anymore is that the case or is it just because they're maybe suspended eat you know what do you think the case is with that is that um, accurate or are people just, I, are they I, just I, trying to think of an excuse why they didn't catch a fish that that day? i don't know i think there's some truth to that but a lot of the smallies that we catch like during the fight they will puke out humongous globs of mayflies out on the boat or in our hands Mm -hmm. And I feel like they just keep eating regardless. They're not gonna. They're not gonna eat crayfish or bait fish at that period. But once the hatch is on, all they want to do is slurp up mayflies, and that's all they're gonna focus on. Wow. So yeah. they just they just keep eating. Sure, man. Fascinating stuff. So so as we get into the summer months, these fish are are you know the 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 hatch is done, the spawn's done, the water temps are heating up. Uh, are, are you targeting? Uh, I'm I'm curious on those inland lakes. Do you find singles or a handful of fish up shallow throughout the year still cruising that, or are they predominantly out deeper? You know, that's a good question. Again, it's lake specific too. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of people who probably visit the North Woods or who haven't visited yet, uh, we have our, our bass man, our bass waters are managed in two different ways. So there's going to be numbers lakes where you can catch a lot of fish and number up you know, catch fish of all sizes and of good average sizes too. And then there's other lakes that are virtual catch and release only. Um, can't really harvest them and they're purposely managed for like a lower population density fishery. So big, big fish like, you know, the monster, you know, six, seven pounders that I like to target and these pictures mm -hmm. up above me, you know, those are going to be the byproducts of those fisheries. You're going to catch very few, but the few that you will hook up that day could be monsters. So, um, so to answer your question on our numbers fisheries, for instance, um, we tend to find a lot more fish that are grouped up in wolf packs. Uh, they could be cruising mid depth areas, or they can be utilizing offshore structures, deep, deep water humps places of that nature. And also if the lake has a high Cisco population, what I like to do is fish, do a lot of open water casting. I'll look for suspended fish that are, you know, up above the thermocline or, you know, subsurface just roaming. Uh, but to find them, you really got to utilize side imaging or if you get 360 imaging on your boat or, you know, live scoping, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, that's going to be an essential tool. Uh, but finding them is, it's kind of like a needle in the haystack. You'll get lucky, but more days than none, you're, you're going to be very unsuccessful doing it. But then another thing that I like to do is to target uh, deep structure offshore. And then usually on these structural areas, you can certainly, you know, pop, pop a handful of fish off of them. Uh, but then on our lower density fisheries, you know, for instance, some of our lakes are over a thousand acres and population estimates have been made, you know, three or 400 adult bass in a thousand plus acre lake. So number not very high. Uh, on these waters, we typically catch rogue fish, you know, one big fish living on a certain spot. Um, they're not really grouped up as often unless there is a presence of forage, which could be ciscos or crayfish are molting in a certain area of the lake. And then at that point, you know, these fish, they'll congregate together to feed together. Wow. 
So, so these these fish that are that are feeding on Cisco, and you mentioned you're you're utilizing your graphs. Are you looking for the fish on the graph, or are you looking for the bait fish? Um, you know, it, it, basically, what I'm looking for is an area of the lake, a basin that is a known Cisco hangout, and then. Obviously, you want the fish to be on screen. You want signs of life, you know, suspended ciscos, and then you can find smallmouth or other predatory fish just trailing them or hanging out in those areas. But what I've learned and kind of what I want to look for on these cisco fisheries is deep nearby structure. So, for instance, if the cisco are suspended, you know, kind of out near the basin over 40 feet of water, what I'm going to want to look for is something, you know, a difference in depth that's in that region of the lake. So it could be like a hump that tops out at 20 feet, you know, something that's above the thermocline too, because that's key, because you're just not going to find really any smallies this time of year under that thermocline because there's no oxygen. But, you know, I'm going to want to look for structure that's in that region of the lake because smallmouth, a lot of times and most of the time, they're ambush feeders, you know. So if there's a school of Cisco swimming up you know, high above my hump, that's my fist right here, you know, smallmouth, they'll rise up off that hump and they'll, they'll chow on them. So that's kind of like what I've noticed and observed. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to look for. Uh, typically like late summer, where is that thermal client at on a, a, like a, just an average size body of water that, you know, I, I guess it, it depends on the depth, but yeah, consistently, so you know, let's say you're not familiar, you know, you're, you're, you're heading up there. You want to fish a lake. It's super hot. It's the end of July. But how do you know where the thermal client is? What would you suggest people look for? Yeah, so not every lake actually establishes a thermal client or stratifies in the summertime. Uh, but typically the behavior of, of our lakes, if they will stratify, they need a depth of at least 30 feet. And um, we need a lot of summertime heat. And this last year, really n not a whole lot of our lakes established a thermal client midsummer. Um, but you know, on some lakes, on average, you know, if the lake is shallower, you can expect a much shallower thermocline of 15 to 20 feet. Um, if the lake is fairly sized, you know, one to 2,000 acres and has a maximum depth of 50 or 60 feet, on average, the thermocline is going to be about 25 feet on that body of water. So it's it's really lake specific. You have to understand and, you know, understand the, the behavior of that lake know whether it establishes a thermocline or not and you know it's it's basically like what you got to look for yeah so so if you're fishing a lake and you know it, it's it's 60 feet deep it's it is hot you you're you're saying that that thermocline could be you know 25 feet down right i would think that would almost help it, it's in your favor because now you eliminate a bunch of water especially if there's a lot of offshore deep humps and things like that right now you yeah. just focus on anything 25 feet of water or less and that's where you should run into these these yeah. fish. would you agree with yeah. that yeah especially if there's that deep structure the deeper money spots the fish will like to gravitate towards because um with with uh thermocline and and stratification coinciding with midsummer you know that's when a lot of these bigger fish they'll move out deep and then they're going to be there for the rest of the year through through the fall months so you know if you can identify and locate that deep structure whether it's you know rock piles down in you know 20 to 30 feet some type of a bottom transition or ledges or drop-offs that continue onward into the deep abyss of the lake. You know, that's where a lot of these fish will be. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, if there is a thermocline in a, in a particular body of water, what I've observed and noticed in our catch rates is a lot of these fish that we'll target in deeper water, they'll only be in twenty to 15 to 20 feet of water. So, you know, mm -hmm. I consider that to be more mid-depth uh, than deep, deep water. Okay. Walk me through a, a, a summer where there is no thermocline in some of these bodies of water. What's the <laughs> deepest you've targeted smallmouth uh, or, or have caught them out of? Okay. So on some lakes, I, I can recall the deepest I've ever pulled fish from is about 40 feet. I don't advise it or recommend it because about 95% of us, we're not going to know how to properly fizz a fish. So I don't even want to get into that or promote something that me personally, I'm not good at. 
Um, might be irresponsible fishing on, in that regard, but you know, on lakes that don't get a thermocline, I have been able to pull them out of 40, 40 feet of water. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think, um, but also if the lake doesn't stratify, it makes it a little bit more challenging then to pattern the lake and to identify uh, what habitat or what depths they're at because fish they can disperse you know they can be spread out then on that particular body of water and you know if, if the water temp holds under 70 degrees there's still going to be a lot of fish up into the shallows and that can happen during summertime cold mm -hmm. fronts and then if there isn't a thermocline then on that particular lake sure what are some of the key baits uh techniques that you're utilizing when they uh when they're offshore and a little bit deeper so I like to concoct my own uh, my own little homemade uh, swim baits. I'm a huge fan of Freedom Tackle, and they make uh, awesome swim bait heads, cone-shaped heads, uh, the Hydra and the Stealth. And what I like to do with them is I, I use a half ounce to a one ounce head. I can put on like a size three, four, or five odd hook mm -hmm. EWG on there, and then run like a four four to six inch paddle tail on it. Um, the articulation of the head gives it a big wobble. What I like to do is bomb cast. You know, if I'm, if I'm working an area that I know fish are holding down deep, bomb cast, let that thing fall down towards the depth I need it to be, and I'm just going to slowly bring it back. Okay. But the big, the big challenge when you're targeting fish that are offshore and deep, you never want to give them a good look at a moving bait like that. So, and you know this from throwing paddle tails and swim baits, you never want to give a fish a good look at that bait. Otherwise, they're not really going to hit. But that's probably my favorite top way of fishing the lakes that are Cisco based where the fish are holding down deeper. Do you mess around with any finesse uh, approaches at all? So I listened to to this week's show. It was from a couple of days ago. We were we were disrespecting the drop shot. One of the guests. I'm not a fan of drop shotting. Sure. <laughs> Up in my region, it's really unnecessary still because our fish are not very pressured. They're not educated, and drop shotting just isn't necessary. So you know, I get a lot of guys who are they live and die by the drop shot rig. But on days when you got to catch them otherwise those guys will die by it and they're going to struggle. So hmm. I'm not a fan of the drop shot, but the finessing that I do like to do is uh, reverting back to Kalen swimming grubs. They make a downsized version that's a three inch size. So what I like to do, I'll rig it up on a lighter action spinning rod and I'll bomb cast those babies. Give, give the fish, if I'm on a clear body of water uh, with that requires more finesse, I will work that as my search lure and as a, you know, a high, high percentage fish catch fish catcher sure yeah fair enough man i mean if, if you don't like drop shot you don't like drop yeah. shot what can i say right no that's great so so a lot of moving baits it seems uh you know just always yeah always Definitely. yeah that's yeah awesome. like, uh, when I, whenever i'm on a particular lake you know when i'm guiding people you 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 know the you know the drill too we got to be at our best for time management purposes we can't live and die by certain spots so mm -hmm. you know we got to hit our milk run of areas um we like to fish a lot of search lures and moving baits first once we roll up into an area of the lake and then obviously once we locate the money spot where there's a lot more fish holding that's when we go in, in for the kill with you know our finesse baits our mm -hmm. jigs our tubes football heads stuff of that nature so right that's right. kind of that's kind of like the philosophy really that i like to employ Sure. So as we get into uh, the fall month, uh, you know, those fish, uh, what are they doing? Are they, you, you mentioned they, they tend to stay deep a little bit still. Yeah. And it's, is there a big, like, how's, when's that attitude of, of that smallmouth start to change? So I would say during like the very first cool down of late summer, that's kind of when their attitude and behavior starts changing. Mm -hmm. Um, Typically what you want going on, you want those upper to mid 70 degree water temps to drop into the upper 60s. And usually at that point, you're, you're already in pre-turnover phase. Um, there, on some lakes, again, this is all lake dependent too. Not every lake is created the same or behaves the same way. Uh, but on some lakes, there will be a major push of fish back up into the shallows. Uh, this time of year, during the month of September, um, the, the bite really accelerates during mid-September. And what I like to do is focus on lakes that have very large, expansive flats. I like to target uh, 
depth of five to fifteen feet. Um, need needs to have a lot of sand too, okay. and also weed lines as well. And usually, if I've got sand or weed lines, that's where yellow perch like to migrate up. They'll move up into the shallows. And one of my terminologies and patterns, I call it September sand. Um, you can cast these sand flats all day. You know, it could be maybe. 50 to 100 acres in size, you can zigzag that whole flat all day and you, it'll keep you busy if the fish are on it. Wow. Let me guess, a, a swim bait. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a perch imitating swim bait. Okay. For sure. Yep. Yep. And so these fish are utilizing that. How long are they going to hang out in that zone? So again, weather dependent, water temp dependent too. Um, and also, this will coincide to whether that lake developed a thermocline or not. Because on lakes that don't get a thermocline that summer, that lake is barely going to turn over then in the fall. Um, so there, it, there's no stratification. That upper level will not mix with the bottom level. It's just going to be very minor and meager at that point, if so. Uh, so, you know, it, it depends. Um, the window, it, it lasts... Up, up to two weeks or more for me, mid-September through the first few days of October. Um, we've had this shallow water deal last up until mid-October, too, once the water is in that low to mid-50 degree range. So, you know, it, it really depends on whether there was a thermocline or not mm -hmm. on that particular season. So how late will you fish into the fall? Well, for me, it's kind of hard because I'm still a hardcore musky nut. So mm -hmm. once October 1st rolls around... You know, it's I have a hard time choosing whether I want to keep rolling for smallies still or if, you know, I turn into full musky mode also. But it really depends on the demand for trips, if guys want to still target smallies or not, and also what the weather's doing. You know, we get a lot of snowy October days where the water, you know, the weather is like 30 or 40 degrees and windy. It's not that fun bass fishing when it's that cold out, but sure. I'd much rather go go swing for the fences and, and catch a home run muskie at that point. I got you. Um, but, but, you know, I have fished deep into the month of October these past few years. I'd say up to 46 to 48 degree water, that's kind of like my cutoff point. That's the last hurrah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. So this is great, Andrew. A lot of good information. We pretty much walked through the whole seasonal movement. And of course, we keep we keep emphasizing this. Every lake's a little bit different. And right. so, uh, you know, your particular lake that you choose to uh, to to fish uh, is going to be different than maybe a, a lake just five minutes down the road. Uh, you know, Definitely. I mean, with all these lakes to choose from, like you said, it's a uh, it's definitely a an angler's paradise up in that area. Uh, I try to get up there as often as I can, not as much as I'd like, but there is a, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of cool lakes up there. And it's, Definitely uh, are. you know, it's, it's neat because some lakes you're going to have, like you were mentioning, uh, vacation and, and jet skiers and all that. Oh yeah. But, Very there, popular. but there's a lot of lakes that really don't, there's not a single house on that lake as well. That so is true. there's a lot of, a lot of options up in that, in that area. Well, we're, we're getting short on time. This, uh, this podcast flew by today. I, I do want to ask you a couple more questions that I like yep. to ask every guest on here. And I probably already know the answer to this, but if you had one bait to use, uh, next year, all year, that's all you could use. What are you throwing? Whatever puts fish in my boat, that's what I'm going to use. I, you know, it's funny. My philosophy is to never be fixated on any particular bait. You don't want to live and die by anything. You want to diversify your tackle selection and just apply apply a lure that matches to the mood of the fish and to their behavior and also to the lake's personality that you're fishing. Um, so I'm, I don't get too fixated on on lures and baits, but I think uh, as our interview here kind of kind of concluded, give me a paddle tail or a swim bait all day and I'll go gotcha. to work. I kind of figured that. So uh, what's your biggest smallmouth? So biggest smallmouth is hanging up behind me, a seven and a half pounder nice. caught from Vilas County. And there's a unique story behind that fish. It kind of, kind of illustrates my love affair towards, uh, you know, the smallmouth and how we have a huge smallmouth crush going on. Right. But I, I caught my PB fish twice from the same body of water, from the same waypoint and same spot, six months apart. So first time I caught it was on a swim bait. 
The fish weighed right at around seven pounds, giving change, you know, some change under seven. And then um, it was roughly eight months later, seven, eight, nine months later, during the month of May the following year, I caught it on a suspended jerk bait, and it weighed seven and a half pounds, ready to spawn. So wow. very, very unique story, and very rarely do, you know, are you able to catch a repeat of your personal best fish but it goes to show you our lakes are much smaller uh, they're more limited resources and they don't have the populations of big bass like you know the great lakes states do or the great lakes areas have or you know even up in canada too so we have much limited smaller fisheries and a you know a big fish like that seven and a half pounds the dnr our local dnr and biologists they've aged them to be about 25 to 28 years old if it does achieve that size mm -hmm. yes very old fish yep. uh that is a pretty cool story man definitely Thanks. so how can how can people get a hold of you follow you on social media if they're interested in and in, uh taking a trip with you uh, in northern Wisconsin, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so the best way to reach me is on my website. I have a very popular bass fishing site. It's called northwoodsbass.com. I've been running it and keeping it pretty well up to date with all sorts of new cool stuff, photos, gear reviews, articles that I try to publish monthly. And then I also have a monthly newsletter that keeps me active and engaged. Um, very easy to find or else if you just Google up Wisconsin bass fishing or F B Wisconsin bass fishing guide, I'll probably be one of the top results on, on your search. Also, uh, you can visit my page on Facebook, Northwoods Bass Fishing Adventures. And also I write for Midwest Outdoors Magazine. So I have a column in there monthly. If you subscribe to it, whether digitally or in print, you can also read some of my material and works on there too, mostly pertaining to smallmouth bass fishing too. Very cool. Wow. So pleasure, pleasure talking to you about smallmouth. It got me excited. I want to, uh, I want to get to Northern Wisconsin like ASAP now, man, this is crazy. I can't wait to get back up there. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and hopefully you catch a catch your next personal best as an eight pounder, right? Hopefully. There you go. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to the podcast. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.